Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about how history gets written. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, I want to write books about history when I grow up. Well, we're not going to talk about the process of writing history today, me from the past. Also, you are a liar. So you're never going to be a history writer, because try as you might, you can't stop making things up. Maybe someday, if you're lucky, you'll write a historical novel, although probably not, because, you know, it involves research, which you also suck at. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about how historians answer questions and the choices they make in turning their ideas into books. We like to think of history as being the story of what happened, so there's no ambiguity or whatever. It's just, you know, in 1776, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. This is part of our thinking that, like, math is fact-based and literature is opinion. So we imagine history as being, like, over toward the facty stuff. But in truth, literature has a lot of facts in it. There are poems that are objectively good and others that are objectively bad. And if you've ever been to a mathematician party and heard mathematician arguments, you'll know that math has a lot of opinions in it. What, I go to a lot of math parties, that's cool. My point is that that whole, like, fact to opinion continuum we imagine in academics doesn't really make sense. We just need to learn to ignore that and think instead about how to examine the world critically. So today we're going to examine the ways that different historians have tackled a really problematic issue. The rise of the West. So what do rise and West even mean in that phrase? Well, let's go to the thought bubble. So the West is a geographical designation, kind of. It means like Western Europe, North America, and Australia. Which, as you can see here, are west of Asia and also east of Asia. In fact, everything is both east and west of everything else because it's a globe. But the West is also kind of a culture. It's a set of ideas influenced by Judeo-Christian thought and Greek philosophy with a little Enlightenment rationalism and Adam Smith's economics thrown in. Anyway, Anyway, it's complicated, like all civilizations that span multiple complements, but most of you at least have an idea in your head when I talk about the West. And then there's the question of what we mean by rise when we talk about the rise of the West, which leads us back to the philosophical question of the nature of history itself. I mean, is history a series of rises and falls, like the story of the Roman Empire, or is it cyclical, like the Mandate of Heaven narrative that we saw when we looked at early Chinese history? So you could say, in fact, that the phrase itself, the rise of the West, is a little bit Western. The whole thing's a bit nebulous. And that makes it a popular subject for historians to tackle, because you can hang a lot of ideas on it. Like Ian Morris, who teaches at Stanford, wrote a book called Why the West Rules for Now, which casts the question in terms of political, military, and economic dominance. And Victor Davis Hanson made this idea of dominance more explicit in his book on military history, Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles, and the Rise to Western Power, which also offers a pretty straightforward reason why the West became so powerful. It won a lot of wars. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Another way to think about this question is in terms of, like, success and failure. That's how Daron Ashimoglu and James Robinson approached it in their 2012 book, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. These guys had two big ideas. First, that success can be defined by wealth as well as political power. And secondly, that when we look at successes, we shouldn't look at individuals or communities or continents. We should look at nation states. Now, this book isn't explicitly about the West, but if you look at the countries that they're talking about as successes and failures, it seems like they're talking about kind of the same thing we are. Their successful nations are all in what we think of as the West, with a couple of important exceptions in Japan and Southern Africa. So Ashimoglu teaches economics at MIT, and Robinson teaches government at Harvard, which is important because they're not like academically trained historians. Some would say that's an advantage, but you know who wouldn't say that? Historians. But anyway, if your training is in economics and government, then you're going to see history through the lens of economics and politics in the same way that if you're trained as an accountant, you might see history as an interminable series of ledgers to be balanced, which it kind of is. And if you're, say, a novelist, you'll probably see history as a series of narratives, and you'll insert narrative even when it doesn't necessarily exist. How we frame historical questions is extremely important, as is the way that we're trained and the tools we use to try to seek answers. So Ashley Mogul and Robinson focus on institutions and claim that a nation is successful when its economic and political institutions are inclusive. This focus on institutions explains a lot, and it's very convincing, and it corrects previous theories. For example, Montesquieu's idea that tropical nations tend to be poorer, either because the people tended to be lazy and to lack inquisitiveness, or because diseases and poor soil inhibit economic growth. But according to Ashimoglu and Robinson, the data just doesn't
doesn't support Montesquieu's conclusions. Yeah, that's a little problem. Oh, it's time for the open letter. But first, let's see what's in the globe today. Oh, it's Montesquieu. Do, do you have a first name, by the way? Oh, he does. His full name is Charles Louis de Secondat Baron de la Bred et de Montesquieu, which explains why we only call him Montesquieu. Anyway, an open letter to Montesquieu. Dear Montesquieu, you had so many good ideas. Separation of powers, that's a definite winner. You basically coined the word despotism. That's a great word. I mean, before the word despotism, our only word for that thing was, like, government. But this idea that you had that poor people were doomed to stay poor has proven astonishingly powerful. And it's also entirely wrong. Fortunately, Montesquieu, most of us have moved on from your theories about poverty, although just recently. Best wishes, John Green.